Hi, everyone. <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming to the afternoon part of our event. Well, my name is Jamie Excel, and it is my, my distinct pleasure to invite yet another distinguished alumni of, of, uh, of Utah to, to the stage, uh, Dr. Uh, Steve Parker. Uh, who is currently at M Media as he's the uh, vice president of professional graphics, and he's been doing a lot of uh, ray tracing related stuff, which is very dear to my heart, I have to say. Uh, before that, though, before joining the M Media 2008, um, Dr. Parker was actually here in Utah, um, or, or is a member of our faculty here. And before that, he uh, had a PhD from Utah in 1999, if I remember correctly. So. Uh, let's, um, we're ready to hear from you, I guess. Thank you. Well, th thank you. So, um, I, I'm, I'm here and I'm to somewhat talk about, talk to the students. And, and so hopefully there's enough students here. Uh, there's others, hopefully will uh, at least be entertained al along the journey. But, and I think they invited me so that I could assure everybody that the fun wasn't concentrated only in the 70s. Uh, but so, so hopefully I can, I can dispel that. So, so hopefully I can dispel that rumor. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and let me tell you a little bit about my role at NVIDIA. So I joined NVIDIA just over 15 years ago uh, as part of NVIDIA research. And over the course of that time frame, we built what is now known as NVIDIA RTX, or real-time ray tracing capabilities that, uh, that ships in tens of millions, I don't know how many exactly uh, GPUs around the world, runs games, and brings what has traditionally been a high-end computer graphics experience to real-time commodity uh, interactive uh, ga gaming. And then the other role that I'm doing now is, is now trying to take that even further. And uh, I'm the CTO of a product that we're building called Omniverse, which is uh, kind of the gathering place for all of NVIDIA's technology. We bring ray tracing and physics and uh, simulation of, of various kinds and uh, content creation and large language models and all of those things into a common, uh, what we call the industrial meta metaverse. And Omniverse is one of the most ambitious projects I, I've ever been a part of. And, and you'll hear a little bit about it, see some, see some cool pictures from it too. But that's what I, what I do. Uh, it's you know, it's a, a long journey and a, and a passion project. I think the most important thing I want to say to all the students here today, and hopefully there are more watching online, you are absolutely unequivocally standing on the shoulders of giants. Many of those giants are in the room today. There are many others that, that, uh, that are not. And this photo is a little bit weird, a little bit slightly disturbing, um, <laughs> but it, um, it, it illustrates the, uh, both the um, amazing capabilities and the limitations of, of AI-generated art, right? The, the, uh, so I told the AI, I said, you know, please, I didn't say please, but I, but I said, maybe that's the problem. I said, make, a, <laughs> make me a photo of, you know, of, of, of somebody standing on the shoulders of a giant who's standing on the shoulders of other giants, right? And, and you know, because that's really how I, I feel like, like, you know, my time here and the, 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 those that built the foundations on which I, which I can extend and build, and hopefully I'm building foundations for others to extend and build in both a technical way and a, a, a personal, a very personal way too. So, um, the, so let me try to convince you of, uh, of this in, in kind of you know, th three, three big topics. I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the giants in my life. I'm gonna to talk to you about kind of where that led me over the last decade or so. Um, and we'll get into some technical tidbits a little bit. And then kind of look forward a little bit. Like what is the, the future? Is it all done? Was all the fun 
in the 70s and 90s when I was there, or is there more fun, fun to be had? In, and so hopefully I'll convince you that, that there's uh, both some challenges and, and some fun. So, and, and there's many, many giants, you know, in a personal level in my life, you know, family, parents, students, colleagues, and, and you know, very grateful for all of them, hundreds of them, thousands of them, and they didn't allot me 45 days to go through all of, all of that, but I want to point out, it, it, with, the, with the benefit of hindsight, I want to articulate nine very specific moments that are almost like you know, flashbulb events in my life, in my career uh, shortly before and, and shortly after Utah that led me to, to where, where I am today. And, uh, and hopefully draw what you can, you know, what, what you as a, a student or uh, faculty uh, can, can take away from that. So the very first one is, you know, what is the spark? What is, how do you ignite a, a passion? I was interested in computer graphics since I was a teenager, uh, watching you know, the work of, of many of the people in, the, in this room. Um, and I was an undergraduate student at the University of Oklahoma. I liked to wander through the library and look at the books. And I stumbled upon one book in particular that out of all the books in the, in the entire engineering library ignited a passion. And in particular, chapters by Eric Haynes and Andrew Glasner. Eric Haynes is actually now on my, on my team. But but you know, that, that were written in a way that was approachable, that I could, you know, as that 21-year-old that, uh, or however I was, that I could understand it and I could, I could be interested in it and I could see that there was more potential uh, to, to go further from there. And, um, and it turned that interest in computer graphics in, in, into a passion. And I wrote, wrote software and, and, uh, and, and things like that. I also paid a lot of uh, overdue late fees for that book. Uh, <laughs> I think probably bought it three, three or four times. But uh, um, the next thing that I was inspired by as an undergraduate in Oklahoma is something that some of you may remember called the Utah Raster Toolkit. And it is how, that is the sing. there was no internet, there was like, you know, this Usenet thing that was kind of hokey, but, but um, you know, there was no advertisement that I saw or billboard that I saw that said the University of Utah was good at computer graphics. It was that was the thing that connected me to the University of Utah. And I knew of Utah because I had family here. My parents were both born and raised here. And I, you know, was, uh, my diapers were being changed when a lot of the, the foundational work was, was happening here. But, um, but that one thing, and the thing that I take, that I take away or in, invite you to take away from that is to build stuff. And you heard about the same thing earlier on the panel. You know, build stuff that's larger than you uh, as an individual. And uh, it, you know, it's s subsequently been replaced by other more sophisticated things. But, you know, but I guess one other maybe t uh, takeaway more for the faculty is the fact that it was called the Utah Raster Tool Toolkit as opposed to the Raster Toolkit uh, was a, a, a brilliant branding move <laughs> that, that led me to, to, to the University of Utah. And one day I was visiting my, my grandparents uh, uh, when, when they were still around and I was like, okay, well, I want to go up to that university. And I want to see what, what that is all about. Is it really you know, more than just this little uh, raster toolkit thing, or is it something? And it was summer, so none of the faculty were there, except for one, uh, J Jamie Painter. And Jamie t dropped whatever he was doing and spent an hour with me and taught me something. Ta stop, taught just you know, as, a, as a teacher and a mentor. And... and I didn't write a specific advice here because there's so many things to, to do. I think you know, making, you know, for the faculty, making time for a curious student that you know, wandered in off the streets or making uh, you know, the, the fact that I was either naive or brave enough to just you know, wander into, into the de department unannounced. And, uh, and, uh, and my experience with Jamie then as well as knowing him at Utah and uh, at Los Alamos 
is that he was always teaching. In particular, the topic he, were, he taught me, and I remember it again like a flashbulb moment, is he taught me what a light expression was. He asked me if I'd heard of it, and, I, and he told me about it, and I, and I was able to, to understand it, it, it you know, in that time period. And so he was, I was able to take computer graphics courses from him. He was a great teacher. The next one you, you saw earlier, Dave, Dave Hanscom. So I, I was accepted to the master's program at Utah, and, and a little bit like some of the earlier stories, you know, I came you know, to get a master's, and then eventually got uh, uh, tricked or sold into getting a PhD. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and there was this meeting, like you, it, you, all grad students have to be at this meeting, and you have to learn how to teach. Well, I, I wasn't offered a TA ship. I didn't have the you know, best grades or best track record that I got in anyway. And, uh, and, uh, and I, uh, there's, this, there's this moment that is like a flashbulb moment that probably didn't mean that anything to, uh, uh, to, to Dave at the time. But there was a bunch of students, and, and I, you know, we all, if, if we're honest with ourselves, have a you know, small dose of, of imposter syndrome, right? And so, so we, we go in, and I didn't know what that was called at the time. But you go in, and there's you know some other student. They're giving a, a you know we were, we were invited to give a, I think a three minute uh, lecture on a topic that, that that we were well acquainted with, and that was supposed to give us you know we were, and we got feedback on on our teaching uh, that Dave was was uh, was able to provide, and the um, the. Topic that I wanted, to, I like. I'm going to do ray tracing. I've been learning all about ray tracing the last two years from that book in the engineering library, and then somebody else did ray tracing. I'm like, oh, I don't know if I should do that because he, you know, he knew all, all, you know, a lot more than I did because I was this, you know, self-taught kind of person, and, and it's like, okay, but I, like, like Dave, uh, you know, came in with a handicap, which is called an electrical engineering degree, and and and. Um, and um, uh, and so I, okay, well, I can do Carnot maps, right? I think it's easier to teach that in three, in, uh, in three minutes, and I can you know, teach people how to do a Carnot map in three minutes. And so I did that, and little did I know, but Dave Hanscom was, uh, uh, you know, immediately said, oh, I need him for my TA for my computer architecture class, which I, I TA'd for him my first year here. And that, I, I came here to Utah without a job, you know, small family, no job, and turned, you know, that, that one thing of just showing up and, and going with, with your gut was able to turn, you know, something where I wasn't even kind of sure how I would finish the first year of graduate school into something that gave me a golden opportunity to, to be on campus and to learn how, how to teach from, from one of the masters. Um, D delighted to see uh, Jim, Jim on the front row. So, so Jim, Jim, your uh, your son Mike Clark is another one of these uh, uh, flashbulb moments in my life. Uh, he was a really good friend, um, uh, tremendous individual. Uh, what was that? <laughs> he he's uh, and one one of the things that he taught me is that uh, is that group projects can actually be okay. I had, I had, in my entire undergraduate experience, had never had a successful uh, uh, experience with a, a group project. But Mike and I kind of clicked and, and got it off and, and uh, worked on compiler project together in John Carter's compiler class. And he's an excellent collaborator, taught me a lot of, of uh, uh, things about Emacs, like, you know, just, you know, basic things. And, and was a, and was a, a, a friend uh, throughout, throughout my graduate career. And it, it was a, truly a pleasure. Uh, to 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 have that experience. Now the the next pivotal moment is is, uh, is Chris Johnson. So, so uh, after my first year of graduate school, I, I and I and I I did well. I worked my tail off in all those classes. I worked my tail off for, for Dave and debugged all those suitcases for for all the students in the in the, in the lab, and um, and and then I. I talked with Chris, and he had this this little dark, dingy office right next to the noisy, smelly, stinky bathroom in the Merrill Engineering Building. Um, and he's like, "Well, I, you know, I think you should come join my group." And I was like, "Well, I don't know, because you know, the, you know, Utah was 
in a, I, let's say, a rut of, of tenuring students or I mean, tenuring professors, and like, you know, is Chris really going to be around, or is he going to, you know, and um, and and it. And I said, okay, well, maybe. And, and then he said, well, you need to get a PhD. And I said, oh, well, I was only just planning to get a master's and then you know, work to support my family. And, and, uh, and he convinced me that getting a PhD was worthwhile and, uh, and uh, you know, hand-raised me as, a, as an academic and a collaborator for, for years. He uh, sent me on my first business trip. He, started me on 25 consecutive years of attending the supercomputing conference, which was broken only by the pandemic. Um, and uh, we spent a week in, in London. We've edited countless papers and uh, learned how, how, to, how to write uh, uh, from him. Uh, countless grant, propo grant proposals, um, and most importantly, he pushed for the resources that, that we needed to, to have a unique resource resource, uh, research footprint. And he helped me uh, apply for the Computational Science Graduate Fellowship from the Department of Energy, which reinforced the value of dis interdisciplinary work. Uh, it also gave me an opportunity to go work with Chuck Hansen and Jamie Painter at, again at Los Alamos. Uh, and it's also where I met my wife, so it worked out okay. Um, uh, and Chris was instrumental in, in, in achieving that. I, and so I was there with you know building the foundation of the ski institute. This is you know ski run. This is my 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 project that that was kind of one of the first kind of group projects that, that we got together as graduate students to go build. Um, and what you saw on the surface is you know pretty pictures and visualizations, but you know what you missed was all the you know Chris editing papers and spending twenty four seven uh, writing grant proposals or trying to work the politics and. Um, occasionally uh, getting arrows in the back in the in, in the process, uh, but uh, uh, but you know the, but it but it did work out. And one of the things that I think is in common with the period that we had with the '70s is we had resources that were pretty unique uh, among the academic department. Uh, we had a lot of SGI equipment. We had uh, uh, Indies and Octanes on our desks. We had uh, a big thing called a Reality Monster, which um, you know, fill, filled half of the, uh, the, the machine room, and uh, we wanted to call it Raptor, but then we uh, uh, split it into two pieces, and so we called it Raptor and Rapture, and that caused no end, end, no, no end of confusion. But because this thing was sitting there, like, well, what, a, what can that thing do? Like, you know, it's supposed to be for this, you know, computational science stuff we're doing, but I'm pretty sure, it, you know, we can use all the CPUs in there for, for some computer graphics. And that begins my engagement with, with uh, who I think is the, the ideal collaborator, uh, P, uh, Pete Shirley. Um, Pete is an idea factory. He'll spin, spin things out. He has a little bit of a contrarian attitude, and that's pro probably my, my, my takeaway for, for, e for each of you is to be slightly contrarian. Um, and he pushed me to publish the, the, the things that we were doing. Um, and he's always upbeat and always positive. And what we did is we built something called a real-time ray tracer uh, using that, that SGI equipment. And that real-time ray tracer at the time was an oxymoron. Um, and we took all of the uh, models that, that were created in, the, in Utah in the 70s, and we built uh, interactive, crude, real-time experiences. And we also found that we could take that thing and use it for scientific visualization. We're able to beat the standard marching cubes and other techniques by orders of magnitude. And, and so it turned something from, you know, kind of a, 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 an experiment for fun into something that was suddenly practical and that won the best paper award in, in, uh, in Viz 98. We'll tell you a little bit more about that because it kind of led to where I am today. The other uh, flashbulb kind of moment is uh, the CSAFE project. Uh, it was led by Dave Pershing, um, and it's called the Center for Simulation of Accidental Fires and Explosions, where the goal was to build a um, simulation of a puddle of jet fuel that's, you, know, you simulate all the chemical reactions and fluid dynamics in the, in the, in the fire uh, that 
and over which you suspend a steel container filled with a high energy explosive and you simulate all the dynamics in that, in that, uh, in that entire event. It was a super ambitious project. Um, I think if we'd known how ambitious it was at the beginning, we may not have ever started. That's how all the best projects uh, begin. Um, it, it lasted over a decade. I was there for, for a decade, but I, I think it went further in, in other forms beyond that. Uh, and Dave was a, a very uh, firm but gentle leader uh, that um, is a style that I continue to, to try to learn from today. And again, we had you know, access to more hardware. It was at the DOE labs, but there were these ASCII computers that was the first petaflop machine. And, and you know, the ASCII white was, uh, I can't read it from here, the 12, ter 12 teraflops. And, and I just want to put that in perspective. Um, uh, I forgot to put the date on, on ASCII purple, but where we're at today, so a single NVIDIA GPU that's about this big, and runs 300 watts is either just slower or just faster, depending on how you count it, the, the, than that ASCII purple. ASCII purple was $300 million, uh, multiple megawatts, and filled a room, and took a, a, a fleet of personnel to, uh, to manage. Um, and there's some things that are you know, weaker about the, and there's some things that are stronger. In particular, it's got 10 times as much uh, floating point horsepower if you're doing AI type type work, and so we'll we'll, we'll get back to that. Uh, you know how we, how we've done this, but you know the thing that I think all the students should be aware of is that throughout its history, Utah has always punched above its weight class. Um, you know why why is it that this you know very fairly small university at the time in this very small state, uh, you know pr approximately hundreds of miles from from anywhere. Uh, uh, why, why is it that, 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 that they're always named in the same sentences as, as other places that are much more common? And so there's, you know, obviously all the foundational technologies that, that I think the rest of this is about. There's the Science and Technology Center, which was Brown, Caltech, Cornell, UNC, and Utah. We were the first, uh, you know, one of the first four nodes on the ARPANET, which became the internet. Uh, the ASCII center that we talked about before was Caltech, Chicago, Illinois, Stanford, and Utah. And, and, and you know, punching above your weight class is a little bit of an uh, angry analogy, but, but, but I couldn't come up with a better one, right? And, uh, and so, you know, I think above all, I, I hope that that, uh, that that continues. But the close of my Utah, um, University of Utah, uh, came w one day on a day, you know, with uh, weather similar to this, uh, where David Kirk and David Lubke flew into town and said, you know what, we're starting this NVIDIA research group, and we kind of like you to, you know, come, you know, do some, you know, start some ray tracing work he here at NVIDIA, and they and they said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I think I, I would really like to build a an engine with ray tracing a, as the a, as the focus. I think it will. You know, it will be able to be useful for for a lot of things, and luckily, and I, and by the way, I told him it would take five years, but but <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, luckily, I found uh, you know fe fellow travelers and people who are already started starting on that project at, at Nvidia. Uh, I worked very closely with Rev Leberedian, who started Omniverse, and so rather than me starting a competitor, I joined his team. Right, that, I, I joined. Uh, joined forces with him to, to go help build that. And so we build the rendering system and, and uh, um, some of the parallel distributed computing pieces of, of Omniverse. So the next chapter is, you know, what did we do to make real-time ray tracing real? Well, in 1980, ray tracing was proposed in, you know, in a, you know, one of the more seminal papers in all of computer graphics history uh, by, by Turner Witten. Um, and I, I, around that time frame, Turner was asked, uh, what would it take to make this real time? And this was his response. And I'm paraphrasing. He told it to me personally, so I'm just kind of going from memory. But he said, well, you go take a bunch of craze in the desert, and you put a red, green, and blue light bulb. And it had to be a light bulb because the blue LED had not even been invented yet, right? <laughs> so so um, you know, tie a red, green, and blue light bulb to the top of each one and fly over it at 30,000 feet. He's a pilot. 
uh, and, um, and, and that was, that was his, uh, his proposed solution. So remember that, remember that, because we're going we're gonna to get back to that. So, uh, so I mentioned some of the work that we had done with Pete about uh, interactive ray tracing. We've started publishing it. You know, how do we use this big SGI the size of a, uh, of a room to, to go, go do that? Uh, we used even larger ones at, at SGI and at, and at NASA. We uh, took models and all the f famous work that had been done decades before and, uh, and uh, produced these, these real-time systems. And then when I joined NVIDIA, we were like, well, let's figure out how to make that work on a GPU. And we produced a, a, uh, a demo. This is now a decade uh, or 15 years old. Uh, but you know, in about one month, produced a demo of that where we you know, had car running. And it looks a little bit flat and sailed by modern graphic standards, but, you know, but at the time it was, at the time the, the common wisdom was, oh, GPUs will never be good at ray tracing. Um, and, um, and so we set out to prove them wrong and then uh, subsequently turned that into a, a stream of, uh, of products and uh, uh, more demos and, and kept ra raising the bar. Um, and it was published in uh, SIGGRAPH of 2010. Uh, the programming model subsequently republished you know, uh, an extended version of it in the uh, CACM research highlights. And the foundation of this programming model are now the, uh, the guts of DirectX ray tracing and the Vulkan ray tracing standards in the, in the industry today. We also kept working on making it more and more realistic. One of these photos is, is uh, one, one of these is a photograph, and one of them is uh, simulated, uh, uh, path traced, uh, and uh, so we had a real or rendered uh, uh, contest uh, around that time frame to see if you could guess which was which. It was super uh, popular. I, for, I have actually forgotten which one is which, and I'd have to stare at it, <laughs> stare at it a little bit to, to know. But you know, but it's you know, you have to treat this thing as a science. You know, get all the calibration and and uh, 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 you know, the entire unit's correct and, and pipeline thing. And the, the core of it is, you know, the, what the core of ray tracing is, you know, how do you find the needle in a haystack, right? So I, I have a, a point and a line, and I want to know what is the triangle that, that is most closely visible along that line. Uh, the most common technique is called a BVH algorithm, where you kind of think of, I have a box, and, a, and in that's or other boxes, and in that's or other boxes, and then, in there is finally the, the triangle that I uh, 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 that, that I want, and so on a on a GPU, this you know runs on our on our SM uh, our uh, streaming multiprocessor, and it runs pretty efficiently. Uh, you can you can do this, uh, but it's the challenge is many thousands of instructions per array, and so what Telly Whitney described as a special purpose processor, what we did was put a special purpose processor in the special purpose processor. Um, and, uh, and that's what we call RTX, or the RT cores, uh, where we took that core of that algorithm and built um, very focused hardware to, to do what was 80% of, of the work and, um, and built fixed function hardware uh, that, that, uh, that works in conjunction with the, the, the uh, uh, streaming multiprocessors on, on the device. And one of the uh, funnest uh, moments of my life, uh, stressful, uh, but also uh, fun, is at SIGGRAPH in 2018, we announced this at, at, at when we launched our, our product line called Turing, which um, we had been able to keep secret for five years that we were working on this. Um, and um, and we built a physical mock-up of the Turner witted uh, uh, glass ball checkerboard scene and invited people to come take pictures of it. If you look uh, closely, the middle one's uh, Don Greenberg and Andy Van Dam. Uh, and uh, I have a picture of me with Turner witted in there, but uh, unfortunately, it's uh, buried somewhere in my millions of photos. <laughs> and uh, you know, we, we, we launched this to, to the world, and the world you know, initially didn't get it, <laughs> but, uh, but, but now they do. So there, there's one other thing that, that we looked at when we first started doing this is, you know, is 
so this is a visualization we made where it's how long does it take? Instead of showing the picture, it's how long did it take to trace the ray in that pixel? And the brighter the color, the, the longer it took. And, and this was a, a, a problem because the ratio between these things is like 100 to 1, right? And so if you've taken a parallel computing science, a computer science class, you've been told that, that uh, ray tracing is embarrassingly parallel, so simple. But when you start putting load balancers and all the data structures and other stuff on this, it's not an embarrassingly parallel problem anymore, right? If you actually try to make it uh, real. And so um, in last fall, we, annou we announced the second major thing that, that we had been working on, which is something called shader execution reordering. And you can think of it as adopting the, the um, techniques that have been built for out-of-order out of processing uh, in an instruction stream to, to ray tracing, where we will sort and bin like for like. And so if, if you're, uh, all the rays that are hitting the shiny part or the, the car paint or the, the wood will all be regrouped dynamically in the chip on the, on the fly so that it can keep up with the, uh, the pace of increase. And um, you know, the good news is you know, we've decided to continue to do more, but I'm not allowed to tell you about it uh, right, right now. But let's revisit what, what, we, what, what we heard, uh, um, uh, what we heard Tur Turner Witted say. Like, what if you just took a bunch of crays in the desert and, and you know, put them in the desert? Well, a cray one was 160 megaflops. Um, and the, the GPU that we're delivering this stuff on is either 83 teraflops or 191 if you count the, ra the ray tracing horsepower. And it's about 500,000 to 1.2 million. And so, but we can do you know, eight megapixel image. So, so you know, there's, a, there's roughly a factor of eight missing uh, in there somewhere. So he, he was pretty close, but, but there is one more factor of eight, and that's where AI comes in. Uh, and so the thing that makes this viable is something that we call DLSS, or deep learning super sampling, where it takes those 1.2 million pixels, and what the images that we show Seven out of eight of them are hallucinated by a, a neural network, and and so you know Shannon lied to you, right? There there is more more information in, in there, and the the it's not that he lied; he just had the wrong problem statement for for the problem that we are trying to solve, and the and the it's not how much information is in a signal; it's about it's also about the information in your experience. Right? And that's really what a neural network is, is doing, is encoding that experience in, in numbers and, and other information. And that you know, cars tend to look like cars, and, and, and people tend to look like people. And so that boosts something that's you know, borderline impractical to, to now something that, that's uh, practical. And so I'm actually amazed that if you take you know, the Cray-1 and where we're at today, and you include the, not only the raw floating point and a factor of eight, it's, you know, one or, it's at least one decimal point, maybe two or three uh, from what uh, uh, Turner's uh, somewhat flippant uh, pr projection. So, uh, so we've uh, continued to push on that. There's uh, working very closely with uh, NVIDIA Research, other Utah alum, uh, Chris Wyman and Aaron Lafon, who leads our real-time graphics. We've taken b these images that were previously minutes to render. They're now 10 milliseconds um, with thousands of lights and hair, uh, uh, dynamically simulated hair on the tiger and things like that. And it's, you know, by crafting every single level of the hardware and software uh, that, that we're able to get there. The, you know, Turner, you know, these images are arguably much more sophisticated than Turner Witted. Uh, original pictures, but we've also had algorithmic sophistication that's increased along the way. It's not just the, the, the hardware that, that got us there. All right, now I need to know how to go forward. So we've taken those raw capabilities, built them into a, a system called Omniverse, and um, we've uh, 
use Omniverse to, to build you know, things like virtual avatars. This is our, our uh, Toy Jensen is what we call, you know, CEO of NVIDIA, um, TJ for short. And, um, and you know, there's all sorts of AI in there that take, can take audio and distort the, the mesh so it looks like it's talking, that, uh, that can have a natural language response like ChatGPT that was referenced earlier, and um, uh, the, the graphics and the physics and all of those things uh, embedded together. And, and there's, there's no, we, we do our very best to have no phenomenological graphics, but to really do simulation and AI enhancements of, of that simulation. And so what do you do with, you know, when you have all of that computing power in, in, in a small piece? Well, what you do is you, you know, build bigger ones out of it. Um, and so we, we announced this just last week. Where this is a 512 uh, GPU um, uh, data center product co uh, called OVX. And we are building uh, a product called Omniverse Cloud. So this, this system has uh, over 100 million way parallelism. And so you know, the, the multi-processing that we talked about earlier is, uh, uh, it, uh, it is where that all began, but, but it's gone a lot further than that. And uh, one of the things we're doing with this is we're, BMW is building a factory entirely in Omniverse years before they will build it physically, a couple of years. And they estimate that it will save them 30% of the cost of this multi-billion dollar factory. And it, um, and we simulate all the robots, we simulate all the, the, the processes that are going through the factory. The factory is so large that the curvature of the earth matters. Um, and, um, it's, uh, and so we built Omniverse to be able to handle the complexity and the, you know, the physical simulation basis of it is, is what enables us to do that. So if you want to sell them a robot that sweeps the floors, you can go prove out whether your robot is going to work in this virtual environment without injecting it into the into the real factory and potentially uh, you know causing uh, expensive delays in, in the product line and uh, and so we're you know taking those pieces now building larger and larger and larger amounts of parallelism that uh, we're building in, in omniverse cloud which you know is is more and more and more and more parallel And I think the best way to highlight what we've been doing is just to show you some pretty pictures, since it's a graphics conference after all.
see it again. So, uh, so there's, um, you know, it's, it's giants standing on top of giants on top of giants, right? That, that, that led to this point, and um, and what's next? I think there's kind of two opposing truths that that everybody needs to have in their mind. Number one, the the pace of Moore's law has either slowed or stopped, depending on how you calculate it. But the pace of computing will continue to accelerate. And, and why, how can those two things be true uh, simultaneously? And I'm running short on time, so I'm not going to go into, into too much detail. But Moore's Law was always an easy target for colloquium talks. And, and, uh, and, and so I'm vowed to, to, never, you know, to, to never give one myself. Uh, but um, uh, the, um, this is my favorite quote. If you know, if you were plowing a field, would you rather use two strong oxen or ten twenty-four chickens? Well, you know, it turns out the chickens won, uh, <laughs> and um, the uh, uh, but you know the 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 shape of Moore's law ha has shifted, uh, and uh, starting in the late two thousand tens, what was known as Denard scaling uh, ended. Um, and began multi-core and special purpose processors and uh, rapidly increase in, in uh, parallelism. Densities continue to shrink, but costs don't. And actually, only two or three years ago, um, projections about what the iPhone costs, the cost per transistor is actually not going down. Uh, and so, you know, so what that means is you know, business models will shift and, and, uh, and technologies will shift. And by the way, it's not for lack of trying. Uh, if you haven't seen this, this is announced last week in our keynote. But we're working with ASML to uh, work on extreme ultraviolet lithography. And there's um, uh, some, you know, all the, the transistors are called polygons. And so all of the, the, the same algorithms we've been talking about earlier to make beautiful pictures also uh, apply here, too. And, um, and um, and this, this is a, uh, an incredible machine. I'll skip some of the videos in the interest of time. But it um, produces, uh, it vaporizes tin uh, with a pair of lasers to pr produce an exactly 13 and a half nanometer uh, pulse of, of light that is used from the masks. And what they're printing is much smaller than 13 and a half nanometers, and so they have to solve the interference patterns that, that will produce the, 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 the transistors at, at the end of the day. Uh, you can have one of your own for a quarter billion dollars, um, uh, and, but it's, it's uh, uh, and we're working closely to, you know, to use AI and uh, accelerated computing to, to help make that, uh, that better. Um, but the appetite for computing continues to grow. It estimated that the global data center uh, uses about 4% of the planet's power um, and is continuing to grow. Uh, chat GPT popularity has uh, been through the roof, and uh, their CEO was um, uh, quoted as uh, saying the costs of inferencing chat GPT are eye-watering, I think is the term he used. Um, and, uh, and so that leads me to three opportunities um, one is, in, for, for, for all of the students in the room, interdisciplinary computing. The advances in computing will come from understanding the entire stack, will come from algorithms and parallel algorithms. We've created new algorithms for sorting in the last few years. Um, we've created, uh, we've cracked algorithms that were previously thought to be serial. We now have parallel equivalents of. And, connections to all the other disciplines, science, language, art, engineering, business, and you name it. Um, I'm going to not talk about the specific parallel algorithm we, we cracked. Architecture, we've already talked about the need for special purpose architecture. And then, of course, uh, it wouldn't be complete without a, a, a nod to, to AI. Every chapter of every graphics book that, will ever be, uh, that has ever been written will have will need to be rewritten because there will be some component in there that will be AI enhanced. Texture, how you even create the textures, or how you look them up, or the, 
the uh, super sampling work or denoising work that, that we've done. And, and it's what I call the, um, you know, the tension between good and evil. So like, what is the graphics of the future? Is it just AI or is it some physics core that's enhanced by AI? And I don't know, like for the first time in computer graphics, you know, that I've been in computer graphics, you know, it's not a linear extrapolation of the, uh, uh, of the present. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, these are some of the ways we think about it, that, you know, that what a rendering algorithm is going to do is not generate pixels. It's going to generate something that an AI can use to, to, to generate pixels. And what that means is that you're trying to maximize the diversity of information in that footprint so that AI can reconstruct that. And so things like coherence and things like that are, are, are not uh, as easy to find. They're still, it's still there, but not as easy to find. And so my conclusion is there's never been a more exciting time in the history of computer graphics because I think the revolution that's happening now, like computer graphics will improve because of connections to language models like ChatGPT. And the revolution that's happening now is just as profound as the, the re revolution that we are here to, to celebrate today. And the School of Computing recognized that in the year 2000 when they changed their name to the School of Computing. I, I argue it was a very prescient uh, change uh, uh, driven by Tom, as you, Tom Henderson, as you heard earlier. And I'll point out that this was seven years before the iPhone was even uh, announced. Um, and it was a recognition that computing was playing a broader role in many disciplines. And I'm not talking about, yeah, I use a spreadsheet to, you know, to, to, to track my, my legal documents, right? But, but deep algorithmic innovation in banking, in languages, even psychology, uh, and, and uh, School of Computing provided a fertile ground for that, uh, for the Ski Institute and CSAFE and other interdisciplinary engagements. And, um, and and I guess I have to, uh, to to make sure that everybody knows, like this, you know, this needs to expand even further. And, and the uh, uh, so out there, there's some, some brochures of how we can all help uh, contribute to the future uh, of the University of Utah Computer Science Department, and let it grow and expand to to include all of the uh, the disciplines in computing, but also the engagements with with literally the entire uh, e economy of, of the planet. There's three pieces of advice for the faculty and staff. You know, please help keep punching above the weight class. I appreciate those that gave me a chance. Uh, you know, Chris, whoever got me, you know, whoever admitted me into the program in the first place. Um, and, uh, and keep the hands-on spirit alive. Um, for the students, I'd also you know, d demand or push it to be a special place. Chase both depth and breadth. The depth that you get here will get you your first job, but the breadth will get you your second, third, fourth, and fifth jobs. Um, uh, embrace parallelism, whether, whether you uh, are thinking about it every day or not. That's you know, right now the only way forward until quantum computing becomes a reality. Um, build something ambitious, something that's bigger than yourself. Um, and, and that was a, a, a tough uh, step for me to take, but something that, that uh, has rewarded me greatly. And then finally, you know, respect that you're standing on the shoulders of, of giants. And with that, I will uh, leave it with what ChatGPT thinks of the University of Utah. So. <laughs> Yeah, Jim. Um, I have a, I'm just concerned. You know that thing with the waves? Uh -huh. that, that was a lot of physics and modeling and also a lot of rendering. How much on the rendering side, how much was that done in real time? Um, I, th I actually can't remember on that one, uh, but we do have a lot of them that are real time, yes. Yeah, I'm just wondering the ones that are super high quality. I'm trying to get an understanding of the power you use. Oh, the power used? Well, so you mentioned it, teraflops. it uses, there's, there's no question it uses a lot of power, but I think the, the, the missing thing is, is about efficiency, 
right? So, so, so um, you know, in, NVIDIA has a consistent track record of being at the top of the green 500, not because of, you know, they use a lot of power, but they have a lot of Listen. flops per watt. NVIDIA is the, I own nothing but NVIDIA. Okay, well, that's good I to hear. NVIDIA. <laughs> but in that, stock, but, in stock. Okay, yeah. but, but, you know, but the, um, but I, in order, it, you know, really because Denard scaling, the, the performance is but, but power efficiency. And I really am concerned what your thoughts are regarding power reduction. I, and yeah. I'd like to know, take, get your fastest, most beautiful rendering thing yep. in the world. Yep. How much power does it use in a 60th of a second? Well, it... it uh, pick, take any, any of that. The, sure. Just tell me the power used yeah. in a 60th of a second. Um, I, 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 can't, can. I, can't I, do, can. I I can't do the conversion to joules yeah. in my head. But, I will but, tell you, yes. that is your most important number because you've got to get you. it to real time. Yeah, but we, we, we do it perf per watt, right, sure. instead of in joules. But perf per watt is our, is our number one uh, challenge, no, no question. Um, because power is constrained everywhere, in your phone, in your laptop, in, even in the data center. Power is the very first conversation we have. We're, they're out of power. Right. Where can we plug one of these things in? And, <laughs> and, you and, probably and, use a power, huge amount of power. And, and what, it, what we're focusing on is amortization, right? So what you see and what I see are, are different, but there's a lot that's also the same. And so if we amortize. can amortize and share, then it makes a, a what more do you efficient mean? What do you mean amortization? Tell me, tell me explicitly what you're referring to. Not making sure. an average of cash return or what. No. What is, and, and what you're doing has to do, because I'm confused, sure. okay? Well, okay, so, so uh, amortization of, uh, of viewpoint. Uh, what? Of, of, sorry, of, amortization of what you see from a specific point of view, right? And, and so if we're, we're looking at each other, but if we both, both look this way, all of the complexity out there okay, yeah. doesn't no, look that different for you and you me, You want to just right? use, do computation yeah. where you need it. Correct. That's one good way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so la lazy evaluation, amortizing between multiple people, uh, multiple viewpoints. Uh, we use a lot of uh, neural yeah, networks to all, decide where to go. You do a great job on that, yeah. I think. Excellent. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem that's never done, right? Yeah. We're, we're, in order to reach the next level, we have to, to drive down power and um, and uh, um, and maybe that's the you know what the next generation uh, w will uh, will conquer. So I think I mean your your idea about parallelism is obvious, but I think all of the innovation. My, what I'm going to say a little about. But by the way, people don't know it, but I had I have to leave, and I'm giving a 15 minute talk at three here. So, uh, but I, I'm just curious about. Uh, uh, you know, the parallelism idea, the architecture, and, which is sort of what I've been thinking about since I talked to Bob Sproul. But the, <laughs> the, no, I mean, yeah. seriously, it's, it's, a, um, it's, it's the key. Yep. It was the key to everything yeah. I did when I was in graphics. Exactly, yep. And uh, so I, anyway, yeah. And, it, uh, and uh, yeah, you know, one of the, uh, one, of, one of the giants for sure uh, the, the, that we, we have stood on in, in this endeavor you know, I, I think what we've learned is that that there is no silver bullet, right? That there's not just one dimension of parallelism. There's there's layer after layer after layer of parallelism, and that there's not one power saving thing, but there's think, combinations and and permutations I think of the, techniques. The energy savings going to come from a parallelism, believe it or not. But I, anyway, that's just I agree with you there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and energy savings to me is right now the biggest issue. It is the but biggest you issue. You can't spend. Tara, you can't, I don't know how many gigawatts yep. you even use to make, but if you're yeah, going to do it, we're not whatever it is, you're going to use a lot of them <laughs> when you do it at 30 seconds. Yep. <laughs> yep. All right. Thanks.